So as my uh, colleagues already already presented cases, I'll start with the case as well. So this is a 24-year-old Caucasian woman with perforating ileoclonic Crohn's disease. She underwent an ileocecal resection one year after diagnosis, secondary to perforating disease. Six months after surgery, she underwent a surveillance colonoscopy which showed moderate recurrence, root GERD's two endoscopic score at the ileocolonic anastomosis. She was restarted on infliximab, five milligrams per kilogram, and continued every eight weeks. Ten months after restarting her infliximab, she developed severe pain in her hands, knee, and ankle. Her physical exam, and this is not my typical exam in the office, but she had tenderness of the right second and third MCP, second PIP, second DIP, her left knee, and tenderness and swelling in the left ankle and left Achilles tendonitis. Her labs were notable for an albumin of 3.3, a sed rate of 34, CRP of 18.5, her ANA was 1 to 640 in a homogenous pattern, and her double-stranded DNA was positive. Uh, her complement levels, SSA, SSB, a CCP, RF, RMP, and Smith antibodies were all negative. Imaging of the hands, feet, and pelvis were normal. She was given a increased dose of infliximab, 10 milligrams per kilogram times one, without improvement. So what I presented, I think, in, in my practice is one of the most challenging uh, cases that you have, trying to differentiate whether a patient has non-inflammatory joint pain, which is not the case here, a type 1 arthritis, a type 2 arthritis, or potentially a reaction to the drug, whether it be some type of delayed infusion reaction or, in fact, drug-induced lupus. So that's what we're going to work through here in the next uh, 15 or 20 minutes. So we'll start with peripheral arthritis. Um, the type of joint pain that our patients can get are joint extraintestinal manifestations. Most common, far and away, are arthralgias without frank joint swelling. There's the posiarticular or type 1 arthritis, polyarticular or type 2 arthritis, and then there's, of course, the axial, axial arthritis sacroiliitis and ankylosing spondylitis, which I'm not going to cover today. And, and interestingly, I don't think our rheumatology colleagues really separate the arthritis like this. They typically just call it an inflammatory arthritis associated with, our, with IBD. So I think in our literature, we break it down a little bit more um, nuanced than they do, which is, I think, a bit unusual. So actual arthritis occurs in about 10 to 20 percent of patients with IBD more common in patients with Crohn's than ulcerative colitis, and more common in women than men. And interestingly, and you see this often in practice where patients say that they had some type of inflammatory arthritis before diagnosis, that actually occurs in about 12% of patients. And as Millie pointed out in her talk, other extraintestinal manifestations such as the ocular disorders, erythema nodosum, and pyoderma are more common if a inflammatory arthritis is present. And typically, radiographs are normal in our patients. These are non-destructive arthritis. The pathogenesis is not really known. There are some HLA genotypes that are more common in patients with the type 1 arthritis as well as type 2 arthritis. Of course, patients with ankylosing spondylitis are known to be HLA B27 positive. And, you know, the microbiome is probably important here as well. Um, HLA B27, transgenic mice raised in germ-free environments do not develop either gut or joint inflammation. So let's start with non-inflammatory joint pain first, which was not the case in my uh, patient that I just presented. It occurs in about 18 to 16 percent, so far and away most common, can affect any joint and usually coincides with active disease and emerges with relapse. So once you're initiating effective therapy, the joint pain should get better. If it doesn't get better, what should you consider? Well, you should consider pseudorheumatism as you withdraw steroids. That's a really nasty uh, symptom that occurs in patients on corticosteroids. Other drug side effects we're going to talk about. And then remember that patients you know, old football players like me can get other forms of arthritis as well. So patients can have osteoarthritis and other problems. 
So the type one arthritis is more common than the polyarticular arthritis. It typically involves less than five joints, typically including one large weight-bearing joint. It's almost always asymmetrical and it usually coincides with active disease. So when your patient develops this, it's typically a short duration, about five weeks, uh, but 10 to 20% of patients can develop chronic symptoms and it can recur in 20 to 30% of patients. So the polyarticular arthritis affects more joints, that's why it's polyarticular, and it's usually the small joints in the hands, particularly the MCP joints, as I highlighted in our case here. It usually does not correlate with underlying bowel activity, which makes it confusing, and it typically persists, and one study reported that the mean duration of symptoms is three years, and it too is associated with ocular inflammation. How do you treat these peripheral arthritides? Well, if it's a type one, you treat the underlying disease and patients usually get better. Rest, analgesics, I use COX-2 inhibitors. There's been two pretty good studies that have shown that COX-2 inhibitors do not uh, uh, result in increased relapse of IBD. Uh, for type one, you can also use intraarticular steroids. Obviously, I'm not doing that, but that is a good treatment. And sulfasalazine, I think most commonly used in our practices now for patients with concurrent joint pain. It can be very, very effective even at low doses. Similarly, for the type two arthritis, sulfasalazine, after COX-2 inhibitors, sulfasalazine is typically my first choice. I don't like using low-dose oral steroids, but I find that our rheumatology colleagues will often prescribe this for this form of arthritis. Methotrexate tends to work very well. And I put a question mark next to anti-TNF because in my practice, I've seen these type 2 arthritides emerge in patients on anti-TNF with well-controlled disease, with good drug levels, and it's really, I think, a bit mystifying why it occurs. And, and sulfasalazine and methotrexate in general seem to work pretty well for this. So what about paradoxical autoimmune reactions? Millie and Alan set this up really beautifully for me. Um, Millie talked about some mechanisms potentially. Uh, the most common forms you've already heard of, but we're now gonna focus on drug-induced lupus. Remember also the patients can develop vasculitis and they can develop interstitial lung disease. And Millie's highlighted this in a, in a, a study that we did with her. The onset of symptoms is typically remote from starting the anti-TNF. So the average is about 41 weeks, <clears throat> but it can range from a day to seven years. And it, Millie mentioned is more common in women. What's the prognosis of a paradoxical autoimmune reaction occurs? It's generally really good with withdrawal of the anti-TNF. Complete resolution of symptoms occurs in over 70%, partial resolution in 15%, and no resolution in the remaining 13%. And the diseases with the poorest outcomes are interstitial lung disease, inflammatory ocular disease, and demyelinating disease, which only resolve in 60 to 70% of cases. So let's focus on drug-induced lupus, which I've highlighted here in the red box. So this was uh, reported cases of 140 cases. The mean age was approximately 50 across a number of different autoimmune diseases. IBD patients only represented 11%. Various different biologics have been associated. And in this study, a little over 50% of the patients were women. This is a, um, the incidence is it's a pretty rare disorder. So this is looking across all clinical trials. There were 14 cases in 1,840 patients, which gives you an incidence rate of 0.7%. Uh, Post-marketing, however, the numbers are lower. You're looking at anywhere from one in 1,000 to one in 500 patients. I typically quote my patients when we're starting a drug, a rate of about one in 1,000. How does it present? It presents with generalized malaise and weakness. It can present with fever and rash, and in, in my experience, it presents with very, very intense joint pain and stiffness. <clears throat> and typically, we, we can see the skin involvement, but we often don't see other signs of lupus like renal or CNS involvement. I just had a patient for the first time that developed recurrent pericardial infusions as a manifestation of her drug-induced lupus, and that's pretty uncommon. In this study that I'm citing here, it was much more common in women than it was in men, although the prior case study that I showed you, it was about one to one. Uh, median duration of therapy was a year. 
Um, all patients had joint pain, and in this study, 30% of patients had fatigue as well as rash. All of the patients in this series had a positive ANA, and 80% had a positive double-stranded DNA. All patients in this series stopped their anti-TNF, but 40% required a steroid taper um, and the median duration uh, before uh, symptoms completely resolved was about eight months. So it, it took a little while for these symptoms to go away. In my experience, it's a little shorter than that with a tapering course of steroids. 70% in this series, series restarted a different anti-TNF, so they stayed within class and only one patient developed recurrence of drug-induced lupus. So you certainly wouldn't do this with demyelinating disease, and, and typically with the psoriaform eruptions, we typically stay away from anti-TNFs if, if it's stopped. But with drug-induced lupus, you may be able to go stay within class. What's the diagnostic criteria? So it's a peripheral arthritis with symmetric or asymmetric, very intense joint pain. We mentioned ANA and double-stranded DNA and supporting features. It's nice if you can get a classic lupus rash that really uh, drives home the diagnosis. And often you can see an antihistone antibody that's positive as well. So this is, uh, you don't see the slide, but this is going back to the pivotal uh, slides with infliximab, adalimumab, and sertilizumab. And what I'm showing you here in black is the per percent of patients that have a positive ANA, and in red, the percent that have a positive double-stranded. These are not patients with drug-induced lupus. These are just the patients in the pivotal trials. And you can see that over 50% of your patients on infliximab have a positive ANA, and about 30% have a positive double-stranded DNA. So if you check these routinely in your practice, and you say a patient has drug-induced lupus because of these markers, that, that's incorrect. It's actually more common that patients have these than they don't. It's less common with adalimumab and much less common with sertilizumab, but you can't make a diagnosis just based on these uh, ANA and double-stranded alone. So how do you treat drug-induced lupus? Uh, first and foremost, you remove the offending anti-TNF. You don't really treat through this. Uh, supportive care. Uh, most of these patients are going to need a tapering course of prednisone, and a minority of them are going to need an immune suppressant as well. And the prognosis is quite good. So resolution occurs in nearly 100% of cases. And it's where you refer to rheumatology is in my case where you're not sure. If you're not sure if it's a type 2 or drug-induced lupus and you need a little help from your rheumatology colleagues, that's typically where I'm sending them. If it's a slam dunk, drug-induced lupus, stop tapering course of prednisone and move on to another drug. So what about rechallenge? I showed you a little bit of data on rechallenge. This is from a different series. So in the 50, there were 54 reported cases of an anti-TNF being restarted once a paradoxical autoimmune disease resolved. In 17 cases, they went back to the same anti-TNF, which I would say is a bad idea, and it recurred in two-thirds, so I wouldn't recommend you do that. In 37 cases, they changed the anti-TNF, and the, auto, the autoimmune disease recurred in a third. And I think there it depends on what disease you're talking about. I think if it's drug-induced lupus, you feel much more reassured about doing this, whereas I said with psoriasis and demyelinating diseases or neuropathy, you're not going to re-challenge in the same class. So what about a couple reactions to the drug? So it seemed like 10 years ago we saw this all the time. Maybe it's because we hadn't figured out that we're not supposed to give on-demand therapy, uh, but we saw a fair number of these hypersensitivity reactions. They typically occur anywhere from a day to 14 days after an infusion, characterized by joint pain, muscle pain, sometimes an urticarial rash, fever, and malaise. And when I've seen this, patients are so stiff. I've had patients tell me they can't sit on the toilet. They just are, feel miserable. And typically resolve with a you know, course of around-the-clock acetaminophen, antihistamine, and sometimes you know, a four-day course, a four-day burst of steroids can resolve this. And you actually can reinfuse after this. It may or may not occur again. Um, typically, though, you're going to premedicate with either a few days of steroids before or a single dose of methylprednisolone, or you're going to do and do a medrol dose pack after the infusion. So that can often prevent this from recurring again.
And we can't forget about the thiopurine, so patients can get hypersensitivity reactions. In fact, I think the last IBD Live we did, um, uh, Mike Engels presented a case of a severe hypersensitivity reaction to azathioprine. This occurs in about 5 to 10 percent of patients treated with a thiopurine, typically within the first month of therapy, and it doesn't appear to be dose-dependent. Um, why it occurs is unclear, but some have hypothesized that the imidazole component of azathioprine binds to these endogenous proteins, resulting in formation of haptins, which triggers the reaction. And patients can be quite sick. I mean, we think about the phone call you get, I just started azathioprine and I'm achy, I have a rash and I have a fever, but this can be quite severe where patients present in the emergency room with rigors, fever, joint and muscle pain, rash high white count, as well as liver, renal dysfunction, and, and rarely you can see shock. And if you re-challenge, you should not re-challenge, but if you re-challenge with 6-MP, uh, most patients develop recurrent symptoms again. So if this occurs, you're done with a thiopurine, you're going to move on to methotrexate or a biologic. So what are my take-home points? Uh, first of all, joint pain is the most commonly reported extraintestinal manifestation. So if you're going to move outside of GI and practice another specialty other than what you're doing, you really need to become a rheumatologist. You can't send all of your patients with joint pain to your rheumatology colleagues. Joint non-inflammatory joint pain and type 1 arthritis are the most common and are associated with relapsing disease. Type 2 arthritis is more challenging and typically is, it happens when patients are remission and sometimes before the diagnosis. Drug-induced lupus fortunately is rare, occurring in 1 in 500 to 1 in 1,000 patients, and in my experience, a diagnosis can be difficult at times. There's a high rate of positive ANA and double-stranded DNA in patients on anti-TNF, so don't be fooled by that alone. Uh, typically, this resolves after cessation of the anti-TNF with or without a course of steroids. And in the experience we have, which is limited, it usually doesn't recur after rechallenge with a different anti-TNF. And lastly, hypersensitivity reactions to azathioprine and infliximab are uncommon. Do not rechallenge patients that develop hypersensitivity reaction to, thiopurine, to azathioprine with 6-MP or vice versa. And in patients with hypersensitivity to infliximab, you can re-challenge, but consider pre- and post-steroids in those patients. Thank you very much. Oh, oh sorry, conclusion of the case. <laughs> so we switched the patient to adalimumab, followed by maintenance therapy. Um, she was dose escalated to weekly without effect. Uh, she got a tapering course of prednisone and methotrexate with marked improvement in her joint pain and swelling. And rheumatology maintained her for about a year on five milligrams daily, and that was eventually stopped. And the patient's doing quite well with some mild intermittent joint pain, but not the swelling and the disabling symptoms she had before. So now thank you very much.